Hey guys, Comic Boom here to review Doomsday Clock number 7. We finally get to know what Dr. Manhattan's been up to, or at least a little bit. Dr. Manhattan finally comes out of the woodworks, and it's good to see, it's good to see. Last issue, guys involved uh, sort of a meeting of a bunch of supervillains, uh, discussing how they're going to deal with the Superman uh, theory and the fact that there might be this government conspiracy that's creating metahumans, super-powered people. And that ultimately, uh, the, even Black Adam uh, is uh, creating a safe haven for supervillains in, in the world in order to protect them against what might be nefarious U.S. government activities to create and control metahumans. And meanwhile, what's all going on behind the scenes is uh, we have uh, Ozymandias, Ozymandias looking for Dr. Manhattan. And he's recruited, uh, he's got Rorschach with him along with Saturn Girl helping him to do it, and along with Mime and the Marionette. Well, the Mime and the Marionette sort of befriended the Joker last issue, uh, and last issue ended with the Joker taking out the comedian. And so here, here we're basically left with uh, the, uh, the machinations of Ozymandias. He uses his cat, Bubastis, as basically a way to uh, attract and to hone in as a home, homing beacon to sort of attract Dr. Manhattan. His cat, Bubastis, is actually a clone of the original cat, uh, the original Bubastis that was killed in Watchmen. Necessary plot device, I think, because they, they have to have some way to combat Dr. Manhattan. So Ozymandias knows that if he, uh, he's discovered that if he utilizes both Alan Scott's Green Lantern, as well as using his cat, his clone cat, as sort of a homing beacon, they can sort of forcibly bring Dr. Manhattan into play. And that's what he does here. John's did a good job, I thought, in earlier issues, planting what I thought were clues as to who Dr. Manhattan is. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case here. As a matter of fact, Batman, when Dr. Manhattan shows up, Batman takes one look at Dr. Manhattan and says, I know who you are. And that's very, very interesting. Now, how on earth could Batman know who Dr. Manhattan is? I mean, of all the issues, and I've pretty much read, yeah, I've pretty much read every single DC comic since Rebirth. Um, wh where would Batman get a clue of who Dr. Manhattan is? At all. How could you even have a clue who Dr. Manhattan is? Uh, that's something that's very, very interesting. Maybe there's something that's going to be revealed, a flashback sequence. What I find really unfortunate is in the six previous issues, we readers haven't really been given any clues as to Dr. Man who B Dr. Manhattan is. I mean, I've speculated. I've speculated on Twitter and I've come up with some theories in past videos. And I might be right on one of the guesses. Uh, and I suppose an argument can always be made for a number of candidates. But uh, it's clear here that uh, Dr. Manhattan is... Um, Dr. Manhattan clearly left his Watchmen universe. He became intrigued with the DC universe because when he popped in to check out the DC Universe. He saw somebody coming toward him filled with hope, the most, the most hopeful among, among them coming toward him looking for hope, and then all of a sudden appearing hopeless. And that I think we're to take from Dr. Manhattan's language that he's referring to Superman. And for some reason, Dr. Manhattan can only see one month into the future. He can't see one month past his own existence. So that leads Dr. Manhattan to conclude at the end of this that he's going to end up fighting Superman and either he's going to be killed by Superman or somehow at the end him and Superman are both going to perish. But he envisions a, a battle with Superman at some point. And in any event, all he knows, Dr. Manhattan knows that he's not going to exist in one month's time. Now, why is that? We're not really sure. What does that mean for the overall scheme and the scope and the plot of uh, Doomsday Clock? I really don't know. In the meantime... Uh, Adrian, uh, uh, Adrian, who is Ozymandias, turns up to be a real jerk. It ends up that he doesn't have cancer after all. So that was really disappointing to me. I'm not going to lie. I thought it made, it made his character infinitely more interesting if he had cancer. I thought he was on sort of a redemption quest to try to save the Watchmen universe before he died and maybe even help some other people or help, help the DC universe. But on the contrary, he does, he's not dying of cancer. It's all fabricated. The x-rays must have all been fabricated. He did that just to manipulate Reggie into becoming Rorschach. And he lied to Reggie about his parents. His parents were not, uh, his father wasn't inspired by Rorschach. 
or influenced by him, but rather uh, Rorschach poisoned his father's mind and his and uh, Ozymandias reminds or tells Rorschach, Reggie, that you're not really Rorschach. I just manipulated you to do that. Your parents died miserable and separated apart from each other and they hated each other. And uh, it was really kind of sad and pathetic. And now how is that going to affect Rorschach? Well, he throws off his mask. Uh, he takes off his mask and uh, before he does that in a fit of rage, he beats the hell out of the Joker. And um, yeah, he beats the hell out of the Joker. He's all depressed. Uh, he wants, because Rorschach, he wants some meaning in his life. You know, Reggie wants some meaning. So when, when Rorschach takes off the mask and basically he's Reggie again, he throws the mask away. And this is after tainting the mask with the blood of the Joker and putting a smile on it, sort of symbolically. It's like poisoned by the Joker and takes the mask off, throws it away. And then he, he, he's kept his own journal of all this and he sends the journal of what has been going on uh, to Lois Lane. As a as sort of a throwback to at the end of Watchmen with Rorschach, before him him dying in in, Watch, in, in the Watchmen series, he sent his journal to uh, journalists and to, and to a news media outlet at the end of Watchmen, and that ultimately led to the true story of the Watchmen story being uh, leaked out into the Watchmen universe and ultimately leading to its um, uh, almost destruction. Apparently, what threw off our universe is. Dr. Manhattan admits to going back in time and interfering with the origin of Alan Scott Green Lantern. And basically what he did, he went back in time and uh, it was in July 16th, 1940, a young engineer named Alan Scott was riding a train over a collapsed bridge. As it, uh, and as it collapses, Alan Scott grabbed onto the Green Lantern and became Green Lantern and it saved his life. Well, Dr. Manhattan went back in time and just moved the lantern six inches away. Alan Scott couldn't grab it and he ended up dying. And it was as a result of Alan Scott dying, the Justice Society was not formed and that had a somewhat of a profound effect on the DC Universe and that would explain at least partially why the Justice Society doesn't yet, yet exist or doesn't seem to exist in the DC Universe. Now. It, how that exactly fits in with uh, the old man's memory there, who is Johnny Thunder, Johnny Thunder's memory, who's now a 94-year-old man, how that interferes with his memory, not really sure, but he seems to be struggling with remembering part of a life or a, a, the life that could have been had Alan Scott not been killed. Uh, meanwhile, Saturn Girl just confirms and reveals that she's coming, she's from the 31st century and she's come back because of, there's an aberration in the time, in the time stream here that apparently is going to interfere with the history of Superman. And so she's come back to, a, to sort of look at that and uh, she's not sure exactly what she needs to do. But a more interesting revelation and perhaps one of the ones that is a little bit of a wild card is, is something to do with the mime and the marionette. Now, we speculated earlier it was hinted at earlier that Dr. Manhattan, while he was in the Watchmen universe, had an opportunity to actually kill the mime and the marionette as they were attempting a bank robbery. Dr. Manhattan, Dr. Manhattan confirms that that was the case here, that he could have killed them, but he chose not to. And he also confirms something we suspected, that he chose not to kill the mime and marionette because the, the marionette was indeed pregnant at the time of that robbery. And he didn't kill her because of who her child would grow up to be. Now, who is her child? Now, my reading of it is, and this is, again, just speculation, is that maybe somehow her unborn child, could it be a reincarnated Alan Scott? I don't know how that could actually be, but what, is, what would be so special about the mime and the marionette's child that would prompt Dr. Manhattan, who's got the power over time and space, why would he care about one mere life form? Why would one life form from seemingly insignificant villains and psychotic villains of that, mind and marionette, so what if they have a child? What's so special about this child? And why would the marionette of all people be giving birth to a special child? He then also alludes to the fact that marionette, he reveals to marionette that in fact, she's pregnant with another child, to which the mime and the marionette were very happy to hear. And uh, very odd, and, and while, so we're looking for these answers, but things happen at such a fast pace. Ozymandias uses Bo Bubastis, his cat, whatever the, however the hell you say his stupid name, forces, uses his cat to force Dr. Manhattan to appear, and then Dr. Manhattan basically tells him about 
the what he the actions against Alan Scott. He tells him that about Mime and Marionette having actually two kids, one of which is he refused to tell Marionette where this other kid is that has is going to play a big role someday doing what we don't know. And he, then he does, he refuses to say anything else. And then he, you know, he he transforms everyone or he takes everyone on sort of a time trip back to 1959 during the taping of the movie of Carl Cole Carver, The Adjournment. And that was that side story of the, the actor Cole Carver who played Nathaniel Dusk in a movie called The Adjournment. Apparently Dr. Manhattan in, in one of his identities was, was present in 1959 and he noticed the same sort of a uh, growing sense of hopelessness in Cole Carver as well that he also saw he hint, that he also saw with who he believed to be Superman in, in another vision feeling hopeless and what does that have to do with everything I don't really know I don't really know but it's prompting a lot of questions um, so in terms of a narrative I don't really know where it's going um, now in terms of the Superman theory it hints that most of the world still has confidence in Superman even though they don't have a lot of confidence in the government that might be engaging in in creating metahumans under the conspiracy theory called the Superman theory. So even though there's a Superman conspiracy theory, Superman himself still garners a lot of respect in the universe. That's confirmed here. So even though it might be getting darker, it's confirmed that at least there's some hope in the DC universe still. So all is not completely dark yet. Meanwhile, Batman, um, Batman does escape. There's a great fight sequence between Batman and the mime and the marionette. And it was really good to see. Uh, there's a there's a fight scene that's not very well done between the Joker and uh, Rorschach. I'm surprised. I'm surprised at how many people talked about how good it was. It's actually really shitty. It's not very good at all. Uh, in fact, in Gary Frank, it was one of the significant misses of the issue. Uh, there, it wasn't much of a fight between the Joker and Rorschach at all. It was done, unfortunately, in the. Uh, this is one this is one place where in this particular issue the nine panel grid worked very well except for the sequence between a fight between the Joker and Rorschach. It never even actually showed Rorschach hitting the Joker. It just showed his fist going up and then coming down. It didn't even show it coming down and then it just showed Joker's teeth. Uh, it didn't it really wasn't much of a fight. The comedians telling him, "Yeah, get the freak." Hoping Rorschach will beat the hell out of the Joker. But it doesn't really there's not there's not really much of a fight scene. The Joker just puts a, a smile on Rorschach's face. Anyways, I was disappointed with the way that sequence was drawn and the way it was laid out. It should have been at least two pages long, and we should have had maybe a double page, or at least a full page spread of some of that action. Uh, so I was a little disappointed there. But having said that, uh, other than that, Gary Frank does a fantastic job here. And I'm, I, I want to just say one other thing too, and this was a comment made by the guys at uh, weirdscience.com, uh, who who are, have some good insights on this issue. And I really appreciated one of the comments they made, and it's about the nine panel grid in here. In particular, when you look, when you compare this, the nine panel grids here with the nine panel grids in, for example, M Mr. Miracle, the nine panel grids here are actually done the way they're supposed to be done. Not like in Mr. Miracle or in Heroes in Crisis where you get a nine panel grid where it's really just the same picture redundantly done over and over like this was heroes in crisis you know lazy on the art taking the same picture just tweaking it a bit lazy on the art boring dialogue insignificant boring dialogue nothing happens compare that to the way it should be done you got nine panel grids but with a lot of action happening far more detail on the art significant dialogue this is the way you do nine panel grids, man. This is this is what it's all about. There isn't a single panel in these nine panel grids that are duplicates or replicants of another panel where they're just tweaking it. Extremely impressive, very well done with uh, breaking up nine panel grids strategically when it's called for. Just very, very well done. What Doomsday Clock is how you do the nine panel grid. And you wanna see the difference between doing it the nine panel grid right versus doing it not so right compare this to heroes in crisis and or even uh, more so it's becoming really abused in mr miracle uh it's you know, mitch garage is really getting well mitch garage is a fairly lazy artist in, in mr miracle it's surprising that he has experiences any delays because all his panels are pretty much duplicates of the other of other panels i'm surprised it 
t takes them longer than a, you know, a day to do a single page if it does that. Uh, it's just an observation, and this is the way to do a nine panel grid. You really, Doomsday Clock, Gary Frank is just doing a fantastic job. Guys, I don't really have any deep insights here as to, uh, as to theories or anything else on this, uh, other than the fact that Ozymandias is kind of a jerk now. He basically has this plant. Dr. Manhattan didn't reveal anything of substance other than what I told you. Uh, it's still very much a mystery. Adrian doesn't have cancer. Dr. Manhattan reveals that. He pisses off Rorschach. Rorschach's abandoned now. Uh, Rorschach's abandoned Dr. He's abandoned Ozymandias and he's on his own and he, he's mailed a, 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 the story to Lois Lane. And, and meanwhile, Adrian or Ozymandias has now, he's got this plan now, not only to save the Watchmen universe, but her own. It actually makes me openly wonder if in fact, if Ozymandias doesn't have cancer, he does appear to be psychologically compromised. Because at least in the Watchmen universe, I could sympathize with Ozymandias. But now, Ozymandias... He doesn't seem to be like a complex character anymore. He just seems to be like an ass. He seems to be an asshole. And he just doesn't seem to be that interesting. Now he's turning into just sort of a one-dimensional villain where he's just doing something crazy for the sake of doing something crazy. Finally, I want to make this comment. Remember that in the pages of Rebirth, and remember in Dark Side War, that the person that we thought was Dr. Manhattan had killed Metron, had killed Pandora, and also killed uh, Owl Man. Remember that? So as far as we know, the three people for sure that have been killed in a blue, f disintegrated in a blue haze of light were Owlman, Metron, and Pandora. Now, we assume they were killed by Dr. Manhattan, but Dr. Manhattan doesn't come across like a villain here. So maybe Dr. Manhattan isn't the villain that we're expecting him to be. Maybe there's another player in the dark here that's really orchestrating and pulling the strings. We always assume that the puppet master here was Dr. Manhattan, but maybe it isn't. Maybe it's somebody else. Now let's look at the three people that we know for certain have been killed by this mysterious person in a blue haze so far that we assumed was Dr. Manhattan, but I might, might not be. Look at the, we're going to look at Owlman, Pandora, and, uh, and Metron. Owlman was from Earth 3, Metron was a new god, and Pandora had a connection to all the universes uh, she, she was involved with Flashpoint and all the universal crises that have ever occurred. Pandora had some role in. She was dealing with the seven deadly sins. And I'm thinking, that Pandora, the seven deadly sins. We got the seven forces of the Justice League universe under Scott Snyder. We, so she's, we've got these connections to uh, Earth 3. Owlman was killed off. He took over Met Metron's chair, but he was killed. Metron was killed. He was killed. Pandora was killed. The Metron, the Mobius is, uh, or Metron's chair has all the knowledge, so it made sense to kill whoever had Mobius's chair because you didn't want that, or Metron's chair because you didn't want that knowledge to get out. You didn't want anyone sitting on that chair and figuring it out. And Batman, when he was sitting on the chair during Dark Side War, didn't know what kind of right questions to ask to help them because he didn't. He never foresaw Doomsday Clock coming. The only question he asked was about who the Joker is and discovered there's three people, but that's a, that's a digression. I'm just trying to think, what's the link between the three people that were killed so far by the person we assumed was Dr. Manhattan? What do they all have in common? What do Pandora, Metron, and Owlman have in common? Why do those three have to be ones that were killed off? That's what I find kind of interesting here. You guys can let me know your theories, but it just it sort of makes me think, hmm, they all have a sort of a multiversal sort of uh, connection somehow. And taking them from the board was obviously very important for the person, the real villain who's at play here. And it might not be Dr. Manhattan. So guys, let me know what you think of Doomsday Clock number 7. And uh, hit the subscribe button. Follow me on Twitter at Metropolis40. I'm under Comic Boom there at Metropolis40. And here, well, until next time, Comic Boom, out.